today we're going to talk about solutions toward a thriving world. So let me introduce Foster Gamble. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I am deeply honored to just even be a part of this group. I've been having a great time at the intermissions just learning from the amazing minds and hearts that have come together in this room. And to have the opportunity right now to share with you some of the thoughts which uh, are most important to me is really a privilege for which I want to thank uh, Jordan Pease, an amazing visionary who... Uh, You know, again and again, it takes one person to say, I'm going to do this. And, and Jordan said that about this conference. Uh, and, and here we are. And I want to thank his whole team, too. Just the quality and the, the, uh, the safety, the, the love in, in this room. Very much thanks to all of you. And I'm also especially uh, appreciative of each of you who've carved out the time, put down the money, uh, taken the risks to come here for two days um, to participate, not just to watch a bunch of talking heads and buy some books and something like that, because that, that isn't what this conference is. Uh, and in fact, that's why Kimberly and I are here. We haven't actually been doing uh, conferences very much in the past couple of years, because we're very busy working on other things. But when Joel told us what this one was going to be about, that we're really getting up to the fulcrum of consciousness itself in terms of worldviews, because it's out of the worldviews that are uh, that our actions come, and it's out of our actions that the, re that the results come. And that was inspiring, but especially the format, the fact that this is about recognizing that we're each, every moment, every insight, every action, the architects of a new paradigm, and that we were going to have a think tank rather than just a show. That's what got us here, and I, I really appreciate it. So the subtitle of my talk is... Principles, strategies, and tactics for the most crucial moment, most critical moment in human history. Now, that may sound like a little hyperbole, but probably not to this group. And what I mean by that is human beings have only recently acquired the dubious uh, ability to destroy life on our planet uh, in a matter of moments. So we've been able to get away as a species with a lot of uh, really destructive behavior for millennia. Um, and we can't do that anymore. We actually need to figure this thing out uh, if we're going to make it as a species. And in order to do that, we need to be clear on the elements of the paradigm that could actually lead to a thriving world for everyone. Uh, and that's, that's what this whole gathering is about. Now, most movements have strategies and they've got tactics um, and I've been an activist all my life, and, and I, I'm here to attest that most of them don't have clear principles. I was a consultant to the Occupy movie, uh, movement in, in several different um, ways, and they had hundreds of issues, like the Thrive Movement does, uh, that they were working on, and it really splintered the efforts because there weren't common principles around which they could cohere the activities. And I really want to explore that today. So I want to recognize that you've been sitting for a long time, and I really appreciate your, your listening. Um, and we're, you know, we're almost there. Uh, you, you'll get something to, to eat soon. Uh, I'm grateful for your listening, and we're going to go a little longer, and we're going to go a little deeper. And we're going to build on top of what all these amazing speakers have done so far. And what I'd like to do uh, with this talk is I'd like to explore three things. The first is I want to give you a glimpse of exciting solutions. You know, Kimberly and I are, are willing and experienced with looking at the gnarly bad news that is going on on the planet. You know that if you've seen the movie. How many people have seen the, the movie? Oh, thank you. Wow. <laughs> yeah, we're happy to report that, that the, the film is, see, is still being seen by close to a million people a month in 27 languages around the world. 
and we don't market it, but so it's, it's people like you being willing to trust the information and the perspective and share it with your friends that's really making all that possible. So I want to start with a glimpse of exciting solutions, because that's what most of our emphasis is on now. Then I want to talk about what's in the way of some of those solutions coming out. And, uh, and finally, I want to share the key elements that I see um, that could get us out of this lethal mess. So, let's start right off with the solutions. One of the great blessings of putting out the communication that, that we did was that it has inspired uh, over 1,050 self-created solutions groups around the world, uh, taking on uh, close to 300 different issues and in, uh, in approximately 100 different countries. Now, if you want to find out more about that, you can go to the Solutions Hub section of our website, and you can search by country, you can search by uh, issue, you can search by sector, uh, and find out who around the world is doing what you're working on. That's the reason we created the Solutions Hub, when we saw all this activity going on, so that, uh, so that groups don't have to all be recreating the same wheel. You can actually share best practices, petitions, lawsuits, resources, information, and so forth through that solution sub. It just makes it a whole lot more efficient and fun for everyone. And as well, because we dared to say uh, a lot about the motives and the means for suppressing breakthrough technologies, we got contacted by now approximately 1,000 different inventors and innovators from all over the world. And so it's been a very time-consuming project, but a really encouraging project to be in communication with all these people. We can't vet them all. We don't have the team and the resources to do that. But we sort through, sorted through various filters, and out of the 1,000, we have approximately 500 of the projects in our, um, in our private encrypted priority database. So we are in touch with and monitoring all of those projects. And then out of those... Um, 500, we have narrowed it down to approximately 70, representing all the different sectors of human endeavor uh, that we're particularly focusing on. And we've inadvertently turned into sort of a cosmic dating service <laughs> where we're hooking up these brilliant innovators in all these different sectors with in investors and philanthropists who uh, are waking up to what's really going on and in, very, in many cases have tremendous wealth, and no matter how much they have, they have been frustrated with not being able to really transform the world for their grandchildren. And so people have been contacting us from both sides, and, and we're in the process of, of putting those together. So I want to share a few examples. This is my favorite thing to talk about. Um, and for security reasons, uh, it will be without divulging the actual names and locations uh, of most of these projects. And this will be just the tip of the iceberg. It will give you a sense of it. In the energy area, Joel talked brilliantly with, it, with his overview, and we've been probably a third of our projects are new energy projects. It, it's astounding all the brilliance that is emerging. So we've been looking at self-charging motors. We, the, the one technology, uh, very inexpensive, you know, runs on a few watts, it has to do with geometry, of course, and, um, and if you get the configuration right, it will boil water in eight seconds. Now, I mean, I'm not a great cook, but I can boil water. So what's, what's the big deal about boiling water? Well, as Joel said before, that's what coal-fired power plants do. That's what nuclear power plants do. And this is doing it for very low, low energy and releasing all, all this energy. So... We've seen radiant energy battery chargers. Radiant ener energy really was what Tesla was working on. We've seen uh, over unity motor generators coming out of various countries around the world. In the area of health, this is one of the most exciting and one of the most tragic areas. Um, we are in touch with people now who are doing phenomenal cures for AIDS, for cancer, for chronic fatigue, and, and a host of other diseases. Uh, and it, 
it's, I've, I've seen some of my friends cured from these things, and, and uh, the hope for the future that this holds is so thrilling. Another uh, new technology has been invented, totally natural. Uh, guys invented a molecule which holds nutrients and then goes through your skin. You just take a shower in it um, and delivers 10 to 100 times the nutrition to the cells that you could ever get from any healthy amount of organic eating. And people are literally getting up out of wheelchairs and, and, and walking and, and at least getting really helped, if not cured, from particularly nervous system diseases. The, uh, the engineer who built a lot of Royal Rife's uh, cancer-curing technologies uh, years ago before he was suppressed has come forward and contacted a doctor friend of mine and, and said that he will share the secrets and rebuild the actual technology. Uh, and, and this guy's in his early 80s. So we're, look, we're trying to get him the funding to, to really do it right and soon. <laughs> In the area of water, there's a, a device which, totally chemical-free, it's a double toroidal uh, vortex device that purifies a polluted pond in 72 hours. There's another one, actually an, an inventor in uh, Marin here, who has created, uh, he's got some patents on the phi spiral as applied to certain technologies. And he's got a little propeller that you can float in the, in the top of one of these million-gallon water tanks that most communities have. Um, and because it will circulate the entire tank and make it into a, a Taurus device, you don't need chemicals that you usually have to dump into the tank because when you get the, the, uh, the water separates into different levels, you get the heat differential, you get start getting bacteria and algae, and you're in trouble. So you're drinking a lot of chlorine and, and fluoride and all that kind of stuff. So this, this little thing that runs on about 100 watts uh, will clean that whole thing. In the area of food, we're working with wonderful organic polyculture and permaculture projects, several eco-communities that are combining things like aquaponics with new energy and alternative currencies all into one community. They're like model communities for what a thriving world would look like. And then we're working uh, with a number of different groups, uh, including the group in Hawaii, uh, who's just been so successful, at least at their last stage, in stopping the uh, GMOs on Maui. In the area of environment, we're working with some teams trying to get them the sufficient resources to hire the really professional, uh, savvy in private investigators uh, to uh, expose and prosecute the covert engineering that's going on, particularly with, with chem chemtrails and HARP. We're working with anti-nuclear groups. That's really where I, I kind of cut my first teeth in, in activism in the, the nuclear freeze initiative that Kimberly worked on way before I knew her uh, and that I worked on for many years. And then uh, our friend Danny Sheehan, uh, his, his group was really the one that finally uh, stopped the, the building of new t nuclear power plants through the whole Karen Silkwood case. We're working with anti-nuclear groups. And... Uh, we're working with several groups that have very innovative ways of restoring contaminated land. Unfortunately, a very big issue. In education, we're particularly focused uh, with our uh, filter of looking through the Taurus as the, the, the sustainable pattern for uh, energy systems in the universe. One of the educational groups that we're working with has developed a, a, a beautiful software program that basically allows you to design and experience your own education, particularly accessing different sources on the Internet as well as a lot of teachers, very you know, awake teachers that they've gathered. And you create, uh, out of uh, just following your own preferences, you create a 3D geometric world where you can go off fractally into various areas that you want to study. And the whole thing is guided by just moving your hand in 3D in front of the computer. It, it's, it's a trip. I mean, people, the young people will love and the rest of us will, will love working on this thing. And then there's another group, um, well, there are a number of educators, uh, Karen Elkins, I don't know if she was planning on, there she's sitting in the back. 
She, uh, she publishes my, probably my favorite magazine in the world, Science to Sage. If you haven't seen that, it's, uh, it takes beauty and geometry and physics and consciousness and blends it into one amazing experience every time that magazine comes out. Anyway, she, uh, she and others are, uh, are really helping us with, to, to help educators design cor uh, courses that are based on the fundamental patterning because the academic courses are so divided into you know, physics and chemistry and biology and psychology and sociology and so forth. But all of those trace back to just different scales of the Taurus energy field. There's another group that has a Taurus-based software for collecting the best solutions uh, and dispersing them from around the world. Injustice. Uh, one of the ones that means the most to me and, and to Kimberly is exposing and stopping child trafficking. And w one, once again, uh, uh, Danny's uh, group, the Romero Institute, is doing this uh, Lakota People's Law Project. Uh, find out more about that uh, from him, but they're, they're literally saving thousands of, of kids who, who are being uh, basically kidnapped and uh, subjected to drug testing uh, and then sex trafficking and so forth. It's just hideous. So he's one of the ones who's taking that on. Also, uh, my, private, my favorite private investigator, Monique Lassan, is, is here, and she's another one of my heroes working in that area. <laughs> Peaceful parenting. Over 80% of the parents reportedly in the United States are still spanking their children and calling it, you know, righteous discipline. That, that, is, that is child abuse. If you, if, if you did that to an adult, you would be arrested and put in jail. And so people are waking up to, uh, to this. Um, my favorite philosopher, um, Stefan Molyneux, has been doing shows on this for years on the Internet. I'll talk more about him uh, a little bit later. But uh, they, by his estimates, their um, podcasts alone have transformed that behavior in over 250,000 families, stopped doing that, and learned ways of communicating, listening, negotiating with, with their children to, to actually do peaceful parenting. Because he believes, and I, I think it's true, that the root of the, the, the problem, the destructiveness that we've got going on in this world right now is uh, abuse during childhood years. So we're getting to the root of it. And then another group that's been doing fantastic work for 25 years but really is ready to go to the whole next level globally in resolving race, gender, power, and class issues. So I could go on and on with that, and, and I would love to, but we don't have the time to do that. Um, so I want to pose the question, what do you think is the common denominator of all of these solutions? Yeah, I'm hearing lots of words that which all are, are, can, I think, be boiled down to this word wholeness. One of the things that, that we're seeing is that all of the issues we're dealing with, they're all breakdowns in the wholeness of a natural system, whether it's, you know, crushing things to, to or burning things or fusing things to access energy uh, or GMOs or, poly, or, or monoculture and so forth. It's taking a natural system, destroying it, and then having to do all these bad things to supposedly uh, fix it. But the, the key is, if we're going to fix those problems, it's a matter of recognizing what the wholeness of a natural system looks like and then figuring out how to restore the wholeness of those natural systems. So all of a sudden, we began to realize that with all these issues... They're really, it all comes back to this awareness of the Taurus, not just as a metaphor. The, the Taurus is the fundamental pattern of wholeness throughout the, uh, the universe. And so as we restore that, the, we're actually being given a blueprint of how we can, can create sustainable systems. So now, before moving on, I want to give you the, the rest of the story with a number of these solutions. Very quickly, in the area of health, the doctor uh, number one that I was describing with the cancer, uh, chronic fatigue, and so forth, um, he, all of his cultures were stolen by an American medical institute. 
Uh, they've slandered him in the public, for which he sued them and won a lawsuit, fortunately. But then there were three attempts on his life, and now he's in hiding in a foreign country. Inventor number two, the one with the molecule uh, and the nutrient delivery, uh, he's under overt threats and harassment. He's being bombarded with, with uh, ELF waves that have his tongue swelled up so he can hardly get it out of his mouth and hardly breathe. His joints are aching. He's he constantly under these attacks. So obviously there are people who don't want these things out. In terms of energy, uh, there are raids on the labs, the patents have been confiscated, uh, lives threatened, gag orders have been issued. Even in the, in the food area, raids on raw milk farms, rain catchment, uh, home vegetable gardens, uh, and obviously people being arrested for growing uh, hemp and cannabis. So how can we not have the new paradigm just be the next regime change, the next tyrannical new world order? How can we assure that these game-changing innovations actually come out safely? So we need to build a little more groundwork before answering that question. So people in this room have probably seen this quote a thousand times, but it's kind of like I love you. It, it, it may sound trite because it's so true. You know, it's so important. So in the, in the context of the new paradigm, these problems that the Thrive Movement is taking on, we realize they cannot be solved with the old paradigm thinking by definition. So we really need to understand what a new paradigm is. So those who know me um, know that I usually carry a dictionary around and if I'm going to be in a think tank the first thing we need to do is define our terms so we know actually what we're talking about. So of course I looked up um, paradigm for this conference. The dictionary says it's a cognitive framework or set of beliefs shared by members of any discipline or group. And it comes from the Latin and Greek roots, you know, at the end of the, of the 1400s. And I was kind of mind blown to see that the, what the roots actually mean is to show the pattern. I was excited about that. <laughs> because those of you who have seen Thrive know I've been fairly obsessed with this particular, what I think is the fundamental energy pattern of the universe since I was a, a teenager. And... For those of you who may not be familiar, it is the pattern of sustainability at every uh, scale of our universe as far as we know so far, from subatomic particles to atoms to an acorn to the planet itself to the galaxy. Uh, still, as I said in Thrive, every successful free energy device that I have seen uh, is mimicking in some way or, or, or creating uh, the toroidal pattern. And then, most importantly for us, a human being itself. We're physically a torus, we're a continuous surface with a hole in the middle, and we're embedded always, we're held by uh, this invisible uh, toroidal field. So why don't we have these solutions out in the world already? Well, a couple of reasons. One is lack of, lack of adequate funding, and that's what we and others are working on very hard. And the other one is suppression, as Joel mentioned a little bit, and I've given you a, a, a few examples. And the suppression is by those operating in an old paradigm. Obviously, if you were in, operating in a win-win paradigm, you wouldn't be blocking these, these cures and, and these amazing technologies to come out. So the problem, I want to suggest, through a quote from Stefan Molyneux, is that the problem is not just the abuse of power. It's the power to abuse. We'll talk a little bit more about um, Molyneux later, but really let that one settle in because we're, our, our culture trains us to go only as far as, well, if we only get the right and leader, enlightened leaders in there and so forth, things are going to work out. You know, if we get the Democrats, that'll work. Oh, no, if we get the Republicans, that'll work. Oh, the Libertarians, that'll work. Well, guess what? It's not working. So 
maybe we're missing this part about giving anyone the power to abuse. Particular, you know, most recently through the NDAA uh, authorizes exactly this sort of thing, where for, for dissenting with the government, you can be hauled off, no attorney, uh, no right to a trial, whatever. Feels kind of like we're being set up for something. So let's look further into this paradigm thing. What is in common with the old paradigms? Since I found out that I was going to be having this opportunity, uh, Kimberly can tell you, I, I've been interviewing people in social situations, professional situations, all over the place. That, Do you, have you heard of this new paradigm? Oh, yeah, sure. Well, what is it to you? So here are the most common responses that I was getting was they, that uh, the old paradigm uh, was disconnected, it was about win-lose, centralized control, power over, and that it's based, the old paradigms have been based on the abstractions of God and government. We'll go into that more in a minute. Before looking into the, what they said about the new paradigm, I want to um, just take another look back at kind of the history of where the paradigms have come from. And I want to do it through the lens of nature. You know, like the process um, of growth from seed to stem, to leaf, to branch, to bud, to flower, to fruit, and then back to seed. There's this natural progression that is going on all over the planet all the time in these seven stages. There's an order in nature, and there's a natural pattern to the progression through developments in consciousness as well. So let's take a look at the correlation of this with some of the other scholars on worldview. This was a, a, a major uh, quest for me for many years, was, was studying uh, other people's histories of the development of consciousness. One of my major mentors uh, was Arthur Young, and he laid out what I still think is the most accurate cosmology for the process of evolution in our cosmos that I've ever come across. Um, and he laid it out in, he, he observed nature in these seven stages going from, uh, from subatomic particles, uh, I mean from pure potentials to subatomic particles to atoms combining into molecules. That's the, the contraction of, of nature into the material world and then expanding out this turn uh, on the other side uh, of the octave where it moves, molecules arrange themselves into plants which have the, this new power to grow and then into animals, which, which can not only grow, but now they can move, and then into humans, which can not only grow and move, but they can actually self-reflect. So when I looked into uh, a lot of the other scholars, um, Dwayne Elgin has got a beautiful model of the, the development of, of human consciousness from archaic humans through awakening hunter-gatherers to agricultural, industrial, uh, mass communication and global reconciliation. That's where he says, that's where we are now. We're trying to move. It's, it's the same turn Arthur Young described. We're trying to move from, uh, from this condensed, solid, you know, th self-threatening uh, humanity into actually blending, you know, learning to harmonize with ourselves, with one another, and with the environment in such a way that we can um, master reconciliation. And then he says, after that, will come global bonding and celebration, then trying to balance all the creativity that's, uh, that's unleashed, and finally, the end of the octave will be the establishment of a planetary-scale civilization. And, and I, I absolutely feel like I know that if we're going to achieve that, it's not going to be through some top-down tyrannical government. It's going to be through empowering the sovereignty of, of each individual. And we'll go deeper into that. But what he describes, actually, he, he got this in a vision himself about 20 years ago. Uh, what he describes is that this is actually the creation of the torus of consciousness at a species level um, on this planet. Many of you are probably familiar with Claire Graves and Spiral Dynamics. There's a similar uh, octave moving up through the levels of memes. Richard Barrett's... Uh, looked at it very much in terms of, of performance and cooperation in corporations. Again, a, a seven-stage level going through that fulcrum in the, in the fourth stage. So, 
I could go on with those models because they're all observing nature rather than just thinking something up. So where is all of this heading? Bucky Fuller says, you know, we're at the crossroads, utopia or oblivion. Arthur Young said it's about increasing degrees of freedom. Uh, others have said it's leading to service, to cosmic consciousness, to peaceful creativity. Another guy who we're celebrating on Monday, Martin Luther King Day, said the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. That's an important one, and we're going we're to unpack that uh, in just a minute. But first of all, I want to get back to, to what people thought about the new paradigm. They said, well, the new paradigm is about oneness, realizing that we're all connected. It's about realizing we're part of a greater consciousness. It's about expanding our capacity to love and be loved. It's about raising our frequency and transcending into the fifth dimension. I'm not exactly sure what that means, but I'm sure a lot of you in this room do. Uh, <laughs> but I, I'm hearing that a lot. And then it's about win-win solutions and relations. It's about mastering collaboration, empowering one another to fulfill our purpose, and using our interconnectedness for good. So my question, and this is kind of the fulcrum of, of, of my talk, um, is what might be critically missing from all that really good stuff that has us actually still on the brink of global police state, uh, environmental destruction, economic collapse, You know, it, it, are you ready to take the red pill? Now, for myself personally, um, I tend to be more of uh, an, like an emergency plumber kind of guy rather than, um, you know, heading up the cleanup crew. So imagine for a moment that, you know, you, 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 go, you drive home or you fly home on, on Sunday night. You, you go into your house, but something smells a little funny when you get up to the front door. You open the front door, and there's this... A uh, tsunami of putrid sewage coming down the, the steps from the second floor down into the, in, into the front hall, into the living room, and so forth. Now, some people immediately are going to run for a broom and a mop. You know, other people are going to immediately call 911 and so forth. My tendency all my life, um, it's gotten me into trouble, but it's also uh, been a very fruitful quest, is to somehow swim upstream even though that's a really unfortunate analogy given my previous <laughs> metaphor, <laughs> to, to actually get up there and find out, is there a toilet plugged? You know, turn off the, the flow to that toilet and then find out what plugged that up and solve the problem. We can clean that other stuff up or other people can be working on that in the meantime. But what is it that's missing that has us in, the, in this predicament? So this is the point in my talk where the Surgeon General and Department of Homeland Security and the NSA uh, really have requested that I warn you that certain ingredients in the remainder of this talk may be hazardous to your paradigm. <laughs> so I want to kind of ease into this one a little bit. Um, you've probably heard of figure ground, this kind of optical illusion thing. But when you look at this, what do you see first? Somebody... Yeah, somebody sees uh, with a saxophone. Now, look at the saxophone player, but then can you also see the woman's face? Okay, it takes a little bit of a shift of consciousness. Okay, now that you're good at it. So, if you're only seeing two old, two old white guys talking to each other, which could be a metaphor for government, um, <laughs> then you're probably missing the Holy Grail, which is the space around all of that. And that's what I want to explore. And th this is not easy stuff. It's going to sound really simple. But um, it took me three months of arguing with the person who introduced me to what I'm, I'm going to be sharing with you now um, before I finally realized that he was making a lot more sense than I was in my arguments. I felt like I was an ethical quicksand, and he kept having answers for all my arguments. 
Well, and, and then to add to the, the humbling nature of this whole thing, it was my son. <laughs> and he had just spent three years of intensive research trying to figure out how the world really worked. He was in his mid-20s at the time. And he came to me and said, Dad, you know, we got to talk. <laughs> uh, and th this is my son, Trevor, and he ended up being our primary script consultant, our content consultant for Thrive. And he really taught me about the banking schemes. He taught me about a lot of the conspiracies, uh, and he ended up teaching me about what we call the liberty perspective. So listen to your children. Even if you've been here longer, they've been doing other stuff. <laughs> and since he introduced me to this, it obviously affected Thrive tremendously, and I've been studying this liberty perspective literally hours a day for the last 10 years. So it's not something that, you, that necessarily just clicks for you right away. Um, and w even, if it, even if the notion does, it's taken me 10 years of study to feel you know, real confidence in terms of what the implications and applications are. And we're going to be going into that. So what is it? What, what's this thing that might be missing? Well, the Dalai Lama points at it. He says, we're at the dawn of an age in which many people feel that extreme political concepts should cease to dominate human affairs. We should use this opportunity to replace them with universal human spiritual values so that these values become the fiber of the global family that is emerging. And I would go so far as to suggest that politics themselves, the very notion of politics, are the extreme concepts that have us in this problem. Winston Churchill, he said, democracy is the worst form of government except for all those other forms that have been tried. <laughs> now, of course, that's become a justification for democracy, which, was, which indeed was the shining light on the hill for the, you know, for the, the world. But if it comes with the assumption that we're done, Remember, Martin Luther King said, uh, it bends toward justice. But I suggest we're not there yet. Thoreau said, there are a thousand hacking at the branches of evil to one who's striking at the root. So what's the root? Well, I'm going to get really, really simple on this one because it, it just helps me to go back to the simplest things I can grasp. So, you know, in elementary school and at home we try to teach our kids most of us try to teach our kids don't lie don't hit even if I'm spanking you don't hit um, and don't take other people's stuff well you know that's kind of obvious we can all agree to that except then even people who agree to that turn right around and they're promoting their next political party, their next uh, ruler. So if politicians are actually lying during their campaigns and then stealing your money, whether you like it or not, as taxes and going out and spending it on their, their cronies and on wars and, and, and so forth, then the very root of civilization, given that government is by definition dependent on taxes, on taking your money in order to survive, the root of civilization then is standing on a violation of human morals. That's a big deal. That's the red pill, or at least one, one side effect of the red pill. So what I want to suggest we've been missing in that figure ground is that the, the idea of government itself is the one thing I haven't been looking at. You look at all these problems with government, but we don't notice that the common denominator all along, even if it's getting a little better in some ways, has been government. So looking at that is like someone, you know, 500 years ago telling you, I think the earth may be round. We'll get into what happens to those guys. Uh, <laughs> So I want to suggest, uh, and Kimberly's mentioned this already, and it can't be repeated enough, in my opinion, 
at least you're going to hear about it the rest of my life, is the, the non-aggression principle. And what the non-aggression principle is, is it's an ethical stance which asserts that aggression is inherently illegitimate, except in true self-defense. Aggression is defined as the initiation of physical force against persons or property, the threat of such, or fraud upon persons or their property. A simpler version, I don't get to hurt you, cheat you, or take your stuff, nor do you with me. Now, I don't know how many people remember from Thrive, this was actually the punchline of the whole movie. I run into a lot of people who think we put that in later on or something like that. I mean, there was a lot of stuff in that movie. But this was what everything was leading toward, where we said, in a thriving society, no one is allowed to violate anyone else except in self-defense. This is the only thing we've found that everyone agrees on. Realize how hard it is to find something that everyone agrees on? Now, I've got to admit, I have had chilling conversations with high-level leaders in the government, in the military, in corporations, uh, in banks, and including in the New Age movement, who say, uh, yeah, I don't want to be violated, but given the state of the world and given how ignorant people are and so forth, I do actually think that I should have the right to tell people what they shouldn't, shouldn't be able to do. And try out that conversation sometime. It can get a little testy, so don't do it at weddings and birthday parties and stuff. <laughs> so if this principle of non-aggression is so important, what's a principle? I want to suggest that, uh, well, the dictionary suggests that the uh, principle is an accepted or professed rule of action or conduct, like in a person of good moral principles. And then a second definition is a fundamental primary or general law or truth from which others are derived, like the principles of modern physics. So you really have an ethical definition and a scientific definition. And one of the beautiful things for me is those two are starting to come together. Okay, I had a conversation. I was actually um, uh, attending one of Danny Sheehan's classes at UCSC uh, where he was teaching different perspectives on the uh, Kennedy assassination. Uh, and someone came up to me a after the, his class, and, uh, and this is a wonderful woman, wonderful activist in Santa Cruz community for a long time. She came up to me and she said, uh, I want you to know I really loved your movie, I, I really liked your, your focus on liberty and so forth. She said, and then she said, but don't we need to be ruled by someone? And that's a moment I won't forget, because I realized, I mean, I believed that most of my life. And I think probably most of us have, if we're honest about it. And when you look at all the election furor that's going on, obviously people believe that. So that's a big one. Don't we need to be ruled by someone? And your favorite's probably on there. So, the, the <laughs> um, you know, Gandhi said, called it, he wrote a book called Hin Swaraj, all about self-governance. He says it's Swaraj when we learn to rule ourselves. So here's my next question for you. Does your new paradigm contain any justifications for violence or coercion? This is, this is kind of the dark night of our political soul here. Uh, and this is what I went through in front of my son, arguing for my particular party or, or policy or whatever, other than true self-defense. So let me share with you some of the most common. Uh, Kimberly and I are actually writing a book on this now. So we'll, br we'll break this out in great detail um, when that's done. But these are some of the most common responses that I've gotten when people were honest about answering this question. They said, well, yeah. It does have violations, but uh, only like in the name of the good of the group. For the good of the group, which is really the slogan of collectivism, uh, where, where the group is more important than, than the individual. Um, and 
I, I don't say this in a demeaning way. I really understand that point of view, and it, it's, it's a means, a lot of people think, to achieving certain values about taking care of people and so forth. And I really I share those values, and I honor them completely. It's just that if you look at the history of collectivism, it's millions and millions of, of deaths within national boundaries, 200 million deaths um, and more in the 20th century alone by collectivist governments. That wasn't including war. So um, in, the, in collectivism, uh, you end up with socialism and communism. Rather than if you actually have voluntary uh, collaboration, you end up with a community. A community is when people voluntarily choose to come together and collaborate. That's not what communism is. Really important distinction, even though the words are close. The second one was, um, well, some people think we have to have centralized control. We need to consolidate power over, you know, for, for various reasons. We need to be able to control the markets as if the natural voluntary interactions of people were something that a few people should be controlling, and or just any more than the environment. Another one is that my opinion of what's fair, it's only fair that we, you know, take from these people and give to those people or whatever, because look at the situation. My opinion of what's fair is more important than other people's rights to be free. And finally, taxes are the price we pay for living in a civilized country. It's the social contract. I don't remember signing that contract. And, it, and in a contract, you actually are, are, are agreeing to something. And that's often followed by, you know, love it or leave it. Like you should give up your property and your home and your, and your family or whatever if you don't agree with my opinion of, of the way it should be. So actually, involuntary taxes, I mean, a kindergartner would know this. If you took half of their candy, they'd be pissed. And they would know something's wrong here. So actually, and I challenge anyone on this, and we can go into this in the workshop tomorrow, involuntary taxes are theft, plain and simple. You own you and I own me. Simple as that. Rape is not the same as lovemaking. The difference is coercion. And the key word in lovemaking is voluntary. I think it's that way in all human associations. Statism. Ideas so good, they have to be mandatory. <laughs> and enforced with a gun. As several speakers said earlier, you know, watch out for that distraction. Watch out when the guy's wearing a gun. Uh, watch out when they tell you that it's mandatory that for your own good and the good of the community, we're going to inject these chemicals into your child as they have now passed the law in California. You know, the, uh, the revolution could start with this. So... Here's the challenging thing that I, I, I hope will stick with you. Once you have heard the moral argument, which is just what I've been presenting a, a, a version of, that it's not okay for you to violate anyone else for any excuse except self-defense. Once you have heard that, if you let it in, if you can integrate the, the logic, the reason, the common sense, the, the sheer morality of that, once you let the moral argument in, then you have moral responsibility. And this comes back to what Kimberly was talking about, about no matter how passionate your intent is, are you fulfilling it with conflicted behavior? Like thinking, that, well, your party should be able to have the power. You know, you don't want this one or that one telling you what to do, but as long as the people who agree with you are in power, and therefore they'll help you get your way, then ah, that's okay. Coercive authority is a lot like slavery. Well, it is slavery. <laughs> uh, we abolish it, coercive authority, not because the alternative is obvious or easy, but because it is the right thing to do. That doesn't mean it will be simple or even safe in the short run. The implications of this are so vast that it can lead to social ostracism or worse. 
as when it was considered heresy by the church to, and the state to suggest that the earth was round or our world was not the center of the universe. So Nicholas Copernicus came up with this notion that maybe, hey, maybe we actually rotate around the sun. Well, uh, fortunately for him, he published that just before he died. Giordano Bruno, on the other hand, who was uh, a big advocate of that theory, born a little later, was burned at the stake for promoting that idea. Galileo Galilei, also a big proponent uh, of this uh, humble notion, he said, in questions of science, the authority of a thousand is not worth the humble reasoning of a single individual. And he was forced to recant his work and spent the last decade of his life under house arrest. So this worldview thing is a really, really big deal. So where does it come from? Well, a real simplistic version is it used to come mostly from religion. But the problem is, you know, different religions had their different ideas of God, and politicians would use the religions to inflict their points of view and so forth. Uh, so then um, along came the, 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 the state and took over even more power. And those two concepts have been the greatest source of human suffering and destruction in history. And then there was a breakthrough. Uh, science. Science actually started to come up with some objective means of determining wisdom, of determining truth. So where does science come from? Well, Greece was a big contributor. Socrates came up with a, a profound method of questioning. Well, he was rewarded with uh, being poisoned with hemlock. And then uh, Aristotle came along uh, and developed a whole system of logic, which is really the underpinnings of the scientific method today. So the quest for truth uh, through scientific inquiry leads to philosophy, and philosophy applied to daily life becomes ethics. But where do ethics come from? Well, ethics used to come from religion. Commandments. But the different religions had different commandments. You know, whose God are we going to rely on? Or do we have to take the word of some, uh, you know, old scripture that supposedly came from someone different from us? Then the state comes along. But whose state? Whose opinion? Science, I believe, has the, the, the possibility of actually leading to an ethics that we can use. What if you could apply the scientific method to ethics? And back to Stefan Molyneux. He made this statement. He said, the greatest fight in the history of the world and the world of ideas is the fight to establish a universal morality. Think about that for a minute. Because we have been trained since childhood, particularly in our generation, uh, that, that morality is relative. Well, there's no absolute truth, and you know we should each be able to look into our hearts and our intuition and do whatever. Well, I'm sure that's what Hitler thought he was doing. And Mao and Pol Pot and, and the rest of them, they all had their justification. So what in the world would a universal morality be? Well, I want to tell you, this is not just some wacky idea. First of all, uh, I don't have time, but I've got three slides, single space, of the history of this idea of non-aggression going back to, to B.C., but this guy, Molyneux, he's a, he's a young Canadian, and he has created the, most, uh, the largest and most active philosophy show in history uh, on the Internet. With, uh, he, he's been doing it for 10 years, and now that he's uh, just recently passed more than 4 million downloads a month of his podcasts. Uh, when I was at the uh, at a National Occupy Conference, the two most energized and, and popular events were uh, a debate between a young socialist and a young libertarian Ron Paul advocate. And you could see the compassion from each one of them that, you know, one of them was really going for liberty and honesty and the other one was really going for taking care of people. And it was intense. Like, which one of these is going to win out? And then I did a workshop on these principles where people finally got a sense of, oh, there may be a way to actually reconcile all of that. We'll be going into that a lot in the workshop tomorrow. He's written a book called Universally Preferable Behavior. Somebody asked me in a public event recently, what, um, what do you think is the most important book in history? And for me, as you might guess, it's not the Bible, it's not the Koran. Um, 
it's this book, uh, Universally Preferable Behavior. Because uh, for the first time, the subtitle is A Rational Proof of Secular Ethics. In other words, he's created actually a, uh, a scientifically based logical structure that shows uh, the requirements of ethics as universally applicable. And all of a sudden, when that's true, you can't, people can't get away with these relative things that benefit them, but not women and not blacks and not people from other religions and all that kind of stuff anymore. So that's available for free from his website, freedomainradio.com. Here's a list of, uh, of liberty authors that, that uh, it's just a short list, but it, the many of them have, uh, have meant a lot to me, and including my son, who, who out of his work wrote a book called The Secrets to Nonviolent Prosperity, The Principles of Liberty. And I got to tell this story real, real quick because um, he was living in Ashland, Oregon at the time, and I, a lot of the awareness that he got that he later shared with me that went into Thrive he derived from, his, from the free lending library called the Rogue Valley Metaphysical Library, <laughs> which was created by our own Jordan Pease. So Jordan informing him, informed me, informed Thrive, which informed probably 50 million people around the, the world already, and that comes full circle back to this conference. Okay, so how do we actually get... I'm, I'm almost done here. I've, I've reached my max time. Let me just uh, wrap up here. The, how do we get from where we are now to a, a free world where people are not only free but also more secure, more prosperous? Um, and we laid out in Thrive uh, three stages, not to be coerced, but what we think are going to be the naturally evolving stages because, you know, we've got big institutions, big uh, governments and so forth right now, so we're not going to be out of that tomorrow uh, or soon. But I think the way that it's going to happen, and the more aware we are where we're heading the more we're apt to be able to navigate getting there. So these are the three stages to bring uh, to a free and prosperous world. The first one is really honors the, the insights and compassion of what Danny described as more the progressive uh, liberal uh, political faction who genuinely, for the most of them, they genuinely want to take care of people most in need. And I share that, uh, that sentiment. Um, we just recommend doing it rather than creating new taxes, new theft, by immediately cutting the military budget in half, getting rid of the Federal Reserve. That frees up close to $2 trillion a year, which would not only handle all these issues for the United States, it would handle it for the entire world. All right. And that stage one is bringing as much reform as possible to our current systems while we're shrinking government. And this is more the the libertarian or minarchist, the, the minimal government, um, where government is only uh, there to protect individual rights and to protect whatever is deemed to be the commons. And this is based on sound currency, no foreign wars of aggression and so forth. And then I believe as, the, as that's shrinking down, genuinely, people will be so much uh, wealthier, so much more more prosperous, they will feel so much uh, more secure. I've done cal some calculations, uh, some with Catherine Austin Fitz, with Bill Still, with Hazel Henderson, and other economists in, in my network, and their estimates were, with, with the combination of free energy and a true free market, I'm uh, moving in this direction, uh, that, that the average family uh, and individual would have six to 10 times the income and assets that you do right now. So imagine that. Just multiply your bank account and your income by, let's just say, eight. And then picture what you, how that would change your life. And then you go out on the street. Everybody is experiencing that. All of a sudden, you're in a world where people aren't having to take from each other. People are starting businesses and creating new jobs and so forth. It's almost hard to imagine. So people ask me, well, uh, it, it seems very utopian. But, you know, could that ever work? Well, whenever we get a glimpse of this throughout history, uh, it... it it's been shown to work. In Northern England, in the Industrial Revolution, way more prosperous and secure than Southern England where they weren't allowing uh, the same kind of entrepreneurship. In America in the 1800s, in Sweden and Denmark, which are held up as the, you know, the model for social democracy right now, they were way more free and prosperous in the, uh, in the early 20th century than they are now. And I've got a number of articles if you're interested in, in actually following the, the, the economics on that. Shanghai before World War II, 
Hong Kong in the early 20th century. But it, you don't, don't just look at nation states. That's going to be a limited view anyway, because they're, by definition, they're, they're, uh, they've got some state intervention. Uh, look at what happened with the freedom in Silicon Valley. Look at the prosperity and the raising of everybody's quality of life that happened there. Look at eBay with voluntary uh, exchange and feedback on when people aren't being honest. And same thing with, with Craigslist. There's something called the Economic Freedom of the World Report that comes out once a year that gives you all the data backing up what I'm saying, that the more uh, politically, socially, and economically free a country is, uh, the more happy, the more uh, prosperous, and the more secure they are. So this is just a glimpse of the workshop. I'm wrapping up this talk. And those of you who are interested in joining us tomorrow, uh, we're going to go into how do we actually go about manifesting the new paradigm in our daily lives. We're going to look at the question, what are the compass and tools by which we can alter the moral course of humanity on Spaceship Earth and create ways of living where everyone has the opportunity to thrive. This will be very practical, step-by-step -step things that we have found works in your personal life, in your projects, and so forth. It, I, I want to divide it ideally into two sections tomorrow. In the first one, we're going to be really looking at the tools. We're going to, it's going to be interactive with you, identifying your purpose, your level of engagement that you're interested in, your sector of interest, your issue of choice, and then we'll be describing uh, some of the most powerful tools that have been effective in other um, activist movements in our network. And then the second one will be an exploration of, uh, of the principle of non-aggression uh, and a stateless society. How could it actually work? I'm not going to go into this now, but it has a lot to do with a dynamic triad of dispute resolution organizations, independent security companies, and private insurance groups. The, they're the three of them balance out in a way that is miraculous. And I'm not talking about Blackwater uh, or AIG. <laughs> they would be out of business immediately in a, in a true free world where they weren't protected by the state. We're going to explore by what authority do the would-be controllers claim to rule us? Okay. And in closing, I want to say I believe the first principles which can guide us out of our lethal mess on this exquisite planet are the scientific principle of the Taurus, the fundamental natural blueprint of sustainable systems throughout the universe, and the non-aggression principle, which is the application of the Taurus in the fundamental ethic for thriving human relations. I believe that this needed new paradigm is calling to us in the same way that the oak tree calls to the acorn. It's already in us. And it's calling us to align with the flow of the Taurus in our bodies and in our emotions and in our minds, in our spirits, and in our relations to one another and to our environment. And it's calling us to express ourselves in the moral integrity that is alignment with the non-aggression principle. And then to take that into economics, into agriculture, into media, into leadership, self-defense, justice, and more. And finally, I just want to appreciate you and thank you for your incredibly full day of listening. And the rest of this weekend, I want to hear from you. I'm really grateful to you for your coming, for your opening your heart and opening your mind, and for your courageous, um, for every courageous moment of your process of architecting the new paradigm. I am convinced that we already have what it takes to thrive. We can do this. We will do this. Thank you very much.